originally from Ashton. Actually, my parents' house is about a block over that way. If you go out in the front yard of the church, you can actually see it. So I grew up in Ashton, lived here my whole life, graduated from Loop City High School, and I got my degree from Nebraska Westland. I have a degree in English, one in theater, both BAs. Yay, bachelors. And the reason I'm here, I spent the past 11 months teaching in Poland. So I've known Phyllis since I was before I can remember. And so she asked me to come over, and ta-da, voila, here I am. OK, so I came home from Poland. I've been back about two months now. And since, I come back, since I've come back, people are coming up to me quite a bit. And they say, tell me about Poland. I want to hear about Poland. And I never really know how quite to respond. I feel like it's the equivalent of you know, me coming up to you and saying, how was 1999? So. <clears throat> I was trying to, whoa, that's loud. <laughs> I don't, do you like that? Because I don't like that. OK. So anyway, I was kind of debating with myself what I want to do today, what needs to happen. And really, it's wonderful what we do over here. We celebrate the heritage of our ancestors, the people that came over. What I want to talk about today is what's happening in Poland now. So I was lucky enough, I did get to spend a year there. I spent a lot of time with a lot of people my age. So I kind of want to fill in about just what I got from that, a lot of the different experiences, what these people taught me. So I really want to keep this as open as possible. I spent 11 months in a university trying to get Polish students to talk to me. They're very much used to being talked at. So getting some sort of a dialogue going, that was a little bit more difficult. So. I want to keep this as open to your questions, your comments as possible. I mean, if you disagree with me, do what my students do. Excuse me, you are wrong. Please. So let's start this way. When you think of Poland, what do you think of? Poor hmm? people. What? Poor people. Poor people? Friendly people. Friendly people. I got that a lot. Farmers. Farmers? Anything else? Vodka. I love vodka. <laughs> Let's get together later. <laughs> what? Krakow is a beautiful city. It's so we're talking about poor people. We're talking about vodka. We're talking about these gorgeous, gorgeous cities. So we can definitely talk about all of those things. I mean, but Poland is so much more than that. One thing I get a lot from people is they come up and they're like, oh, you've been to Poland. Have you been to Krakow? Have you been to Auschwitz? Yes, I've been to both of those, but there's so much more to Poland than what's in that 30-mile radius. So really, that's what I want to try to get to today. So I have a few things. I didn't want to make this kind of a slideshow where it's like, ooh, look at my pictures, because you know, being forced to look at someone's vacation pictures, that's not really an enjoyable afternoon. So I've got a few going in the background of just some really kind of major Polish holidays that I got to witness. I had a fascinating year to be in Poland. It was actually in the American news this year, which was great. I mean, well, not for great things, but you know, people were paying attention to Poland. We had, um, well, there was the plane crash that killed the president. That was all over the place. Uh, the flooding. Obama actually pulled um, the missile project that was set to be happening in Gdańsk, up in the northern part of Poland. And him and his I don't know, associates or whatever you want to call them, the people that were working underneath them that are supposed to be fact checking, kind of made a little bit of a mistake because they pulled that missile deal on the anniversary of the day that the Soviets had invaded Poland. People were not happy. More of a positive thing, Poland is or was in the last physical year the only economy in Europe that grew. So they are self, well, more of a self, um, I don't know if you want to call it self controlled economy or self-contained, but they do still use their own currency, so that's probably a big part of it. All right. So kind of my plan for today is first thing, the things I want to get to for sure. I want to talk about All Saints Day, which is a huge deal over there, not so much over here. Talk a little bit about their Christmas traditions. I was lucky enough I did get to go to Kaczynski's funeral in Krakow, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, some of the flooding and then Corpus Christi. So just to give you a little bit of background on how I ended up there, how I got this opportunity to spend a year in Poland, rewind a little bit. Um, 
I did my undergrad at Nebraska Westland, decided I wanted to study abroad, knew I wanted to go to Eastern Europe, knew I didn't want to go somewhere that was on the Euro, so where do I go? I started looking into Hungary, I started looking into Poland, my mother's family, my mom's right there, she's pretty. Um, <laughs> My mom's family is 100% Polish, so I had kind of always grown up with this idea of, I was Polish, really didn't know what that mean. We eat pierogi, we eat a lot of kielbasa, meh. So started looking into that, and really what it came down to, the Polish website was easier to navigate than the Hungarian site, went to Wrocław. I spent six months living in Wrocław here in the south, and for some reason I really, really liked it. Um, people always ask me, you know, why do you like Poland? I, can't quite pin it down. Honestly, I probably have a tendency to make things more difficult than they need to be, so that's a big thing like. Um, I like the people, I like the language, I really, I like the culture, the food is excellent, as evidenced over there. So I came back and my senior year in college, I had the opportunity to apply for a Fulbright scholarship to go over as an English teaching assistant. Does anybody know what Fulbright is? It's a grant program through the US Department of State. So they send students from the US abroad and in exchange, countries send students to the US. It's mostly to do graduate work. So it depends on the country. There were four ETA slots in Poland. Um, if you go to Spain, sometimes there's 20. I think there was 100 and, over 100 in Germany, 140-ish. So anyway, to apply for Fulbright grant, lots of draft revisions, lots of paperwork, lots and lots of waiting. We applied in October, it um, came back in January, who had made the finals, and then in April they announced the winners. There are four grants to Poland in April, number five. So, started to plan other things. I applied to write the obituaries for the Lincoln Journal Star on Sunday, and on Monday, this was in June, I was offered the grant. So, yay, went to Poland. And in university circles in the US, Fulbright tends to be this very kind of prestigious thing. You know, not many people get Fulbrights. Oh my God, you're a Fulbrighter. So I kind, of, I kind of expected this going into Poland. The best advice anybody ever gave me when I got the Fulbright was Fulbright is a crapshoot, which kind of dis, what's the word I want? Kept me from I don't, expecting quite a bit. So I get to Adam Mishkevich University in Pose 9. I ended up teaching right around in Pose 9 in Wielkopolski. And Adam, Adam Mishkevich, Adam Mishkevich, famous Polish poet, whose most famous, po famous poem incidentally begins, Lithuania, my homeland. <laughs> so Polish borders have been redrawn enough times. He was born in Lithuania. By the time he died, it was in Poland. Poland claims him. And one of their best universities is named after him. I ended up teaching in the Institute of Linguistics at Adam Mishkevich. I get there day one, they're like, I introduce myself, I'm Maggie, I'm the Fulbrighter. Oh, you're the Fulbrighter. What's that? <laughs> they don't know. It's like, we have this person, we don't know what to do with her. And I soon very, very quickly found out this is kind of the baseline of Fulbright, as at least the English teaching assistants in Poland. Like I said, there were four of us in country. I was at Adam Mishkevich, and they honed in on that whole assistant thing. I was told first day one, you are not allowed to have your own class. You will help this person and this person. Okay. So there was another um, ETA in Warsaw. She was teaching at the city campus university. Very, very smart individual, had her um, teaching degree from Columbia. She gets there, they don't have anything for her to do. We have this graduate student and this graduate student and this graduate student, you can be a sub. They did not give her a class to teach until March, and because that was, somebody went on maternity leave. Um, in Gdańsk, there was another woman that was teaching. She taught two master's courses, that was it. And then this is my favorite one. A um, friend of mine from California was teaching in Kielce, small little kind of blue collar town in southern Poland. She gets to, it's called Jan Kołanowski University, and it's kind of the equivalent of a community college. Goes into the head of the English department, first day she's there, sits down at this woman's desk, she gives her a list of eight classes, says, these are yours, have fun. I thought she was going to have a conniption. And they forgot to tell her, one of those classes met that afternoon. So the teacher did not show up day one of classes. So, and honestly, I never really met anyone in Poland who knew what a Fulbright was. I did one time, it was in Zakopane in February. 
I was traveling with the other Fulbright ETAs because we were on break, and it was cold, we were bored, so we were inside, we were drinking vodka, we were playing a game called Dvajishti Yedin, which we had invented, 21, in which you lick the back of the playing card and stick it to your forehead. <laughs> and so I'm sitting there, vodka, forehead, and this guy asked us, why are you in Poland? Well, we're the Fulbrighters. Ah, Fulbright, that's very prestigious. Yes. <laughs> so Fulbright, not all it's cracked up to be, but great experience. By the end of the year, I did um, teach, let's see, I had six classes of English speaking and writing, which I taught mostly to second year students. They were probably about, they were average age between 18 and 20. I did have a couple of classes of third years I also worked with, but let's see. Yeah, I had four classes of second years, which were kind of my dominant class. Most of them had been studying English since they were eight or nine years old. So they were at the point where they were very, very, very fluent. Um, it was really a matter of trying to refine their skills. So one thing, the big thing we focused on, I want you to write a persuasive argument. When you persuade somebody, what do you do? If you want to persuade me, what do you got to do? Talk to me. Convince me. So you're gonna have, you're gonna stick to one side of the argument, right? So if say you wanna persuade me, you know, we're having the Polish Heritage Fest, we're only gonna make fruit pierogies this year. So you're gonna tell me why it's good that we should have fruit pierogies. You're gonna tell me everything bad about the meat kind and the cheese kind, you know, they go bad. Everybody likes, you know, mulberries and all that. Well, Polish writing, they don't do that. They like to present this side and this side and at the end, they're both very good options. Because Polish is, it has a tendency to be very, very flowery. In English, we like things to the point, especially at the university level. We like things to be clear, concise. This is what I want you to believe. This is why. They don't quite understand that. Well, they did by the end, I hope. But, so that was the majority of my year right there, was trying to get students to create some sort of a persuasive argument. But in the end, I got to do a lot of one-on-one um, -on -one writing consultations with my students, which was a great opportunity to talk to them. <laughs> Try and get them to tell me, okay, this is what you think, this is what you believe. Um, when the Kaczynski plane went down, that was really when I finally got to start and hear their opinions. A Couple of them wrote papers on it because they had to write letters to the editor. I finally got somebody to talk to me about it because they were very kind of mum about the whole thing. And as I said before, um, there's a lot of hierarchy in the university. A lot of I'm talking at you, you listen to me, and then when you have your degree, maybe you can have your own opinion. So I think I was a little bit different in that regard. It was, I was more their age, I talked to people a lot one-on-one, -on -one, and they were willing to tell me what they thought. So that's how I got to be in Poland, that was what I did, that was my job. Any questions about that before we kind of move on a little bit? Okay, cool. So, a couple things that I wanted to talk about. I made my list and now I lost my place. Okay. So, the first thing, I got to go to, well, I lived in a dormitory that was actually, it was kind of right on the edge of the city. Because to get to school, it was 10 minute walk, 20 minutes on the tram, another 10 minutes of walking. So, it was a little bit of a commute. I always, my mom works in Grand Island. I always like to joke, you know, my mom commutes the same amount of time I do. I don't leave the city. So, I live, but I actually liked living out there because I lived near the biggest cemetery in the city, which was a good place to go running because Polish people are crazy drivers and in the cemetery it's no cars, which was wonderful. <laughs> Although you do get some strange looks, but I don't really speak, so. All right, so All Saints Day, November 1. Polish people really, they don't celebrate Halloween. It's starting to creep in just because of the influence of mainstream, you know, US media but it's not really a holiday. I tried to get some of my students to meet up and we'd carve pumpkins. One of them got very angry with me because I was encouraging people to waste food. So, and actually in Poland, I would see pumpkins in the grocery store quartered the way we buy watermelons, which was kind of fun. But All Saints Day, um, everybody spends with their families. It's, Poland is a very family-oriented society anyway. We always like to joke that Polish families were kind of like the mafia. You can't really get in, but once you are in, you don't want to get out or bad things will happen. <laughs> so everybody went with their families and they go to the cemeteries, they clean the graves, they decorate the graves. I had a lot of pictures of that earlier. 
Um, beforehand, they started adding a lot of trams or streetcars, extra lines to near where I lived, just because that was the line people would take out there. So there were extra trams. Um, people started going to the cemeteries kind of like pre-gaming for All Saints Day. They'd go and they'd clean things a little bit early. Or uh, A professor of mine actually told me, it's not uncommon for small children to be taking to the cemeteries on a field trip to prepare for All Saints Day. So I would get up early and go for a run, go through the cemetery, and I decided that day I'm going to get up extra early and I'm going to get this out of the way and nobody will know I'm there. So I get there, it's probably 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning. There is literally a traffic jam going to the cemetery. So many people are trying to get in. So I went home, changed my clothes, went back, and it's just massive amounts of people going through the cemetery. They all have their flowers, their candles, there's vendors out front selling food, cookies, whatever you want. And everybody goes and they kind of set up their candles, decorate their graves. So I'm walking around and I actually ended up spending the day with this older Polish woman. She was probably in her 80s. I think her name was Ella. I'm not sure though. I called her Pani the whole time, you know, ma'am. And so I ended up, I asked her if she needed help because she had these two bags and was carrying her candles all by herself. So I ended up going with her, carrying her things, and she took me to where her husband was buried. And I speak, I call it Tarzan Polish. I stumble through. And so in very, very, very simple instructions, she kind of told me what to do. And I ended up kind of cleaning her husband's grave and getting rid of everything, setting the candles out for her. And then she and I sat on that bench and ate toffee together. That is by far one of my favorite memories. I was with this woman for maybe half an hour. And that is one of my favorite memories of the entire trip to Poland. So I took her off to her friends and I just kind of spent the rest of the day wandering the cemetery. And by nightfall, every grave had a candle on top, at least one. Some of them had multiple. I mean, if there was a monument or something like that, people would just put a massive amount of candles in front of it. And so as you know, night fell, the sun set, it just looked like the whole cemetery flickered. People would adopt graves, make sure they were decorated as well, and the whole place just glowed. It was, it's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in my life. It was really, really quite wonderful. And then I went home because I was tired. <laughs> okay. So that's All Saints Day. Um, somebody was asking me, because they said November 1 is All Saints, November 2 is All Souls. I didn't really see anything for All Souls. So. Hmm? Yes, Mama? Do you have questions? <laughs> this is my roommate, by the way. She lives in Germany. Well, she lived in Germany. So. So, yes, torment her, please. Yeah. According to Kenny Mashka, it's all <laughs> I have no idea, to tell you the truth. Okay. All right, so any questions on All Saints? Um, questions, comments? Random Maggie, you're wrong. No? Okay. So. Saint Stanislav? When you, yeah, when you said that, really the first thing that came to my mind was John Paul. Of course, John Paul too. Well, Chestahova, the Black Madonna. That's their Nash. Okay. I was told they didn't choose the saint, but they chose her. And I, I'd believe it. I don't know. Yeah. Oh, that um, Mary was the patron of Poland, that they didn't choose a saint, they chose Mary. I didn't know that. That's interesting. Everybody had kings or queens, mm -hmm. and they chose her rather than... Rather than... Interesting. Okay, I'll buy that. Um, let's see. So, I have a question. yes, go ahead. They ran through. Did they not think that was disrespectful? No, not really. I wasn't. I saw a couple other people out there running. Not very many, but whenever somebody asked me about it, I would always just try and say in Polish, you know, no cars, no cars here. And then, but as long as you really didn't bother anybody, they didn't bother you. And I was usually out there either early in the morning or late in the afternoon. 
I mean, that day I definitely turned around and went back. I probably would have gotten hit by a car had I tried to keep going. <laughs> it was always funny to me. There was a sign out on the front of the cemetery gate, and it said, like, open 7 a.m. to 6 p.m., 24, you know, all year except for All Saints, <laughs> like, except November 1. The hours changed. So it's a, it's a very, it's a cool holiday. I mean, it's very specific to that country. I don't think anybody celebrates it quite that way. They call it All Saints Day, but they're decorating the, the you know, the plot that yeah. they have, and that's honoring yeah, it's, the, the person that has passed away rather than a saint. Mm -hmm. I don't it's, a, it's just, but, but it's all saints. Yeah. Oh, that oh, could oh, be, because it's just, it's the family gets together and honors their dead relatives. and. I've never found Polish cemeteries to be really depressing or anything. I, as weird as it sounds, I spent a lot of time in that cemetery. I went walking there all the time. That was just kind of my spot. But it was always very well kept. It was very well decorated, and there was always somebody there. I was never by myself in that cemetery. And that place was huge. It was like a park. All right. Anything else on that? Or else I'm going to move on to Christmas. So who doesn't love Christmas? Okay, so I didn't actually spend Christmas in Poland. I actually, when Lacey was in Germany, she lived with the family, so we spent Christmas there. But kind of what I've gotten about Christmas, I got through my students before, after, whatever. And so Poland, the tradition is Christmas Eve is a little bit more important than Christmas Day. Well, a little bit's an understatement, quite a bit more important. And so you don't eat meat on Christmas Eve, but you're supposed to have 12 courses, and there's supposed to be one chair open for, you know, your unexpected guest. So anyway, carp was the traditional food when communism, well, under communism, it was available, it was cheap. So a lot of people still like to have carp for their Christmas Eve dinner. So I was asking my students about this because you go to Tesco, and if you haven't noticed, a good portion of my knowledge comes from what I got out of my students. Um, you go to Tesco, and they have, Tesco is kind of the big Walmart equivalent, and they have these huge fish tanks full of live carp. And people actually go to Tesco with a big thing of water, you know, bucket of water of some sort in their car because they're preparing to take the fish home. They will buy this carp live, take it home, and they'll keep it in the bathtub for a couple of days. And I was asking my students about this. They sprinkle sugar on the water, and the fish eats the sugar, and then it lives in this clean water for a couple of days, and they like to think it cleans it out. I don't know how well it does, because they eat mud. But, <laughs> but that was the thing. So we come back the Monday after um, Christmas or whatever it was, and my students just did not want to talk. So we're asking, OK, me and my cooperating teacher, who had the carp jive? Who had the live carp? A couple of them raised their hand. And we're like, okay, so who in your family kills the carp? Just out of curiosity. And so Pavel raises his hand and he's, yes, my grandmother kills the carp every year. I remember when I was little, you know, I sneaked out of my bed and there's grandma with her cleaver chopping off the carp's head, you know, <laughs> scarred for life. And so another of my students, Easy, Stan, uh, says something about, she's like, oh, yes, every year my family has the carp jive and every year my father electrocutes it with an old hair dryer from the communist era. <laughs> Okay, he literally takes the hair dryer, apparently throws it in the water, and dinner. <laughs> so yes, that is one of my favorite stories. <laughs> so, yes, I always found that fascinating. That and the other thing was, if people weren't going to keep the carp alive in their bathtub, they just kind of throw the carp in a Tesco bag, tie it up, and they're dry walking through Tesco, fish is flopping in their cart. <laughs> That's normal. Okay, so that's kind of the Christmasness that I got to observe. Um, any random questions on carp or killing of carp? Or they have good night mass. Then. They do, yeah. So I think it's tradition, and once again, I'm not quite sure on this. Um, I think they eat dinner and then go out to church. And the other thing, um, they have, I call it fish jello. I'm really not sure what the name of it is, but it's very traditional. For some reason, you have your little fish or whatever, and then they coat it in gelatin. So I went to my um, institute Christmas party, and the fish is covered in jello. 
and I could not, I scraped it off, it still wasn't very good. Uh, a friend of mine that lived in Warsaw, this guy's originally from Kansas, he was studying at the Physics Institute, we were having a conversation about the carp jello because he had spent Christmas with his friends, um, his Polish friends, and so they had insisted that he eat the carp jello. And then the next day he went to Christmas at another friend's and they insisted he eat the carp jello. And he told me later, he's like, that is the closest I have come to gagging in this country. So, yes, if you go to Poland over Christmas, you will eat fish and jello. Once again, I don't know why. Okay. So, rock. Santa Claus? Yes, say, what is it? St. Nicholas's, St. Nicholas's Day, though, was more of a big deal, it seemed like, for the kids. As, um, yeah, when everybody puts their presents in their shoes. Is that right, in their shoes? As, um, my cooperating teacher came to school after, because I don't know, didn't know anything about St. Nicholas's Day. I lived in a dormitory. And so he comes in and he's got this giant brand new coffee cup because he was a coffee addict. And he was telling me his daughter gave it to him for All Saints Day. Well, not All Saints Day, St. Nicholas's Day. And the other thing I had explained to me um, was that Polish Christmas presents tend to be very, very small things, but they tend to be very, very thought out. So you don't give somebody something unless it's you know, something that relates directly to them or something you've thought about extensively. They're much, much more personal. Yes, Mama. Can you tell them about the, the decorating for Christmas, like outside with the lights versus what we do here? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Um, it's basically the opposite. They put up their, I left for Germany on, um, it was probably about the 17th of December, and there were really no Christmas <laughs> lights out and about because Advent to them is a very somber time. I remember one of my friends came over and she was telling me, you know, now is Advent and so I'm not going to go out anymore. I'm not going to drink anymore. I'm going to just, you know, think and reflect and this is the time that I do that. So they don't put out Christmas lights because they're kind of a happy thing. I came back after New Year's Christmas lights everywhere. They had put everything out and it's the same with the Christmas tree. It goes up on Christmas Eve and then they keep it out till February. Exactly. And we put up ours up around Thanksgiving and then take it down, you know, before New Year's. Which I personally kind of enjoyed because the winter there was very, very cold and long and dark. And so you had, you know, these extra Christmas lights, which made it a little bit more bearable. Just kind of a note on um, cold, long, dark winters. January, it never got above freezing. Most days it was single digits. Um, the sun came up at 9 p.m. By 4.30, it was dark. Although in the spring, in the summer, we kind of got the flip-flop. Um, the sun was up in full force by like 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning. Did not set till 11 p.m. Oh. So if you're like me and you feel the need to be outside when there's daylight, that became an issue. <laughs> yes? A lot of people do. A lot of... Yeah. You don't want to have white shoes there either just because of the dirt and the soot. A lot of people have coal. Um, if you go down to Katowice, that's a big mining town. A lot of the coal comes out of there. And I saw a lot of people, like in the neighborhood where I live, they'd be out chopping wood. I saw that quite a bit. Yes? Can I get back to that fish and the jello? Yes. How do they cook the fish? Do they fry it? Is it I mean, is it... It's, is it Whole? I mean, do you eat it? It wasn't it fried. No, it wasn't raw either. I want to say it might have been baked. Baked. Okay. As I went to a Thanksgiving party. I had some American friends. They were in the U.S. military. They were both actually West Point graduates. I taught with the wife. And so I ended up sitting next to one of their Polish friends. And she started telling me all about, you know, the carp and how everybody eats carp and nobody really likes carp. So now, you know, people are starting to buy more. I don't know, expensive fish. Her family buys salmon now because it's around and they can afford it. But a lot of people, like I said, they do stick with the carp just as the traditional fish. And you know, you talked about that Christmas tree being up. Now that, now I, there are times when I go past the house after Christmas and they'll still have it up a month or two months uh -huh. later. And I'm thinking, it must be a soldier that they're waiting to come home and they're going to have their Christmas. But maybe it's, maybe it's, maybe a, it's a tradition. 
It could be. It could very well be. Yeah, like I said, I enjoy. I like just the lights of it, and I yeah. I like the whole concept. Although I must also note that the Christmas tree in the town center in Warsaw looked like they were trying to signal aliens. <laughs> it was like this psychedelic cone. <laughs> if anybody wants to see it later, I have pictures. <laughs> okay. So anything else? Um, I'll move on to. I got to actually. I was in Poland when the plane went down in Katyn that killed, it was, I think there were 98 people on board, including the president of Poland, Lech Kaczynski, and his wife. Did ever, people read about this in the newspaper? Yeah. Okay. Yes, Poland was in the world news. And actually, I had acquired a TV by that point. And so it was, it was kind of like, it reminded me of 9-11 here, where it was the only thing on the news, and they were like streaming bulletins across the bottom. But it was very, very, there was very much this collective patriotic sense of mourning because I was out in the city with a friend that night. This happened probably about nine o'clock in the morning, and by mid-afternoon, there were flags everywhere. You would walk by the old communist blocks, there was a flag coming out of every window. They were on top of the trains, they were on top of the trams. It was very, very impressive. But the original plan was they were going to bury Kaczynski and his wife in Warsaw, in the state graveyard. <laughs> And so I had my friend from Kansas lived in Warsaw, and we were all the Fulbrighters that I kind of ran around with. We traveled together a lot. We were all going to go to Warsaw and go to the funerals, kind of just go and see. We were in country, and we could afford it. Why not? So we made hotel reservations, figured out what we were going to do, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden, they moved the funeral to Krakow, and they decide they're going to bury Kaczynski in Wawel. And Wawel is kind of the big national castle where all the very prestigious Polish leaders, poets, are buried. I think the last person they buried there was a World War II pilot from the 40s. And so this is kind of where the controversy came. People, people became very, very upset that they were going to bury Kaczynski and his wife in Wawel because if you talk to people about Kaczynski's presidency, the majority did not like him. He was very, very conservative. Um, I actually had a couple of students refer to him as anti-Semitic. They thought he was kind of holding back Poland's progression. So a few of my students actually wrote papers on this as well. Um, they felt that they were bearing Kaczynski in Wawel for the way he died and where he died rather than what he did in his life. So I ended up going to Krakow. It was about an eight-hour train ride to get down there. But that was also about the time of the volcano, the big ash volcano in Iceland. So Obama was originally supposed to come, as were quite a few heads of state of other nations. And at the point where Obama was going to come, security was insane. Um, they actually cut off the cell phone networks in the city. Um, we ran into a, uh, he wasn't a Secret Service agent. He worked at um, the embassy in Warsaw. He was American. And we had met him during Fulbright orientation. And I always remember this guy because he's like, use your spidey sense. So if something you know, gives you a bad feeling, use your spidey sense and walk away. So we ran into this guy and we asked him, you know, do you get to see Obama? And he told us, I don't even get to see the people who see Obama. But after Obama canceled, then everything kind of lightened up. And it really wasn't as, I don't know, sc not scary, but the city wasn't on that big of a lockdown anymore. So to get in the city center on the day of the funeral, you had to go through the cop, like security. They patted you down, they checked your bag, blah, blah, blah. You couldn't actually get into the church. Uh, VIPs could get into the church. One of the Fulbright um, researchers stood in line to try and get in the seats because she had a Polish passport. Without a Polish passport, don't even try it. I th think she ended up standing outside the church, if I remember correctly. But it was very, very interesting to be in this Renek during the service just because it was very collective. It was very respectful. There was no one protesting the fact that they were putting him in Babel. But it was OK until about the time that the funeral started, because you could watch it on these huge screens. And then that's kind of when the big rush of people came through, and you were just kind of swept away with it. And I remember like being shoved through this crowd, just person to person, thinking, you know, this must be what it's like to be born. Because you can't really stop. You just got to go with it. And so <laughs> seriously, if you, were, you went down there, that was not going to be good. But then after you left the Rinnek, it was almost like you were entering back into reality because there were still there people on their bikes. I mean, it's, the rest of the city was fairly well deserted, but there were still people out and about doing their daily things. 
And then, of course, I ran into a priest in Subway, which was always an interesting thing. <laughs> but yes, um, some of my students actually told me later on that their opinion, um, Kaczynski will eventually be removed from Vavil once everything kind of dies down. So I don't know if that's going to happen. It's an interesting theory. So any questions on Kaczynski? Um, I don't know about being born. I don't remember it. But <laughs> yes? What was the insider read on the whole fact that the pilot seemed to have received some pressure to go ahead and go in in spite of the visibility? Kaczynski himself um, yeah, there's, was kind of the daredevil. Was that, what was kind of that? Um, I've heard a lot of different theories. I mean, there's a lot of conspiracy theories that go along with it, just with the whole anti-Polish people don't really particularly care for the Russians. Um, there's a lot going around about kind of Kaczynski's temper, whether that had anything to do with it. I mean, I remember I got an email from a friend right after that happened. It might have been the day, and all he said was, question, why were all those people on the same plane? No. But it was very impressive to me, I guess, how smoothly the Polish government transitioned. But at the same time, our constitution, in a essence, is modeled after theirs. They had a constitution before the US did. Theirs was just never ratified. And so it's the same system. Everybody is built. To, all their positions are made to be replaced. So that's, there's all sorts of things. I mean, if you get on Wikipedia and look at it, they have a lot about the conspiracy theories. Anything else of that nature? Um, well, people that were underneath them stepped up, I think, even that day. But there were, it was three months. Was it three months? They, yes, it would have been three months that they announced the, or maybe less than that, because the last election was July 4th. They immediately announced when the next election would be, and the next election had been set to be that summer. So then they just pushed it up. And I don't remember the week, I want to, it's not three months. I don't remember the amount of time that they had to give. But um, Kaczynski's twin brother actually ran for the re-election, and I had a big sign outside my dormitory for a while, and it was like, Poland is the number, or the most important is what it translated to. But he did not win. Anything else about plane crash, Kaczynski, everything that goes with that? Yes? So was his funeral in the cathedral up there at Basel Castle? Um, his funeral was in St. Mary's Basilica, right off the Rinneck, and then they moved him up to Basel. But it was Calvary. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Poland is 95% um, white and Catholic. Um, they're one of the most homogenous societies in the world. Homogenous, um, most of one kind. So Did they take his body in a special way from that point to the other point? Um, they actually had it on TV. They followed it with a helicopter. You could watch him be moved from Warsaw to Krakow. Because I remember they had it on the screen in um, the Krakow City Center because we got there the day before like, and watched them take him out of the church in Warsaw because they had a public viewing and then move him down. And I remember like the whole Rinneck was absolutely somber. And then all of a sudden you hear these little kids running around screaming and clapping and they're chasing pigeons in front of the screen. Yeah. <laughs> they were funny. Yes. Um, you talk about Catholic. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have a vision of that in my mind, but as you being the age you are and among those type of ages, do you see <coughs> that age just saying they're Catholic and not practicing? Oh yes, this is interesting. Um, a lot of my students, I got a few of them to talk about this. Uh, they consider themselves, at least the majority of them, I would say probably at least 95%, if not more, consider themselves at least culturally Catholic. They do go to church. Um, their parents, their grandparents, their grandparents especially are the very, very religious ones. What I saw a lot with my students was they're kind of in this back and forth, what am I going to be type of thing. There's this very, very traditional side, and then there's a lot of things creeping in from Western you know, um, Europe, um, the US, just the amount of media they're exposed to, what they want to do. And I think, 
I think it's difficult to not be Catholic, to renounce that, because it's just, it's so much a part of the culture. And Poland is, it's a very family-oriented society, and I think that's one of the big things people do with their families is they go to church. So I, th I think they are starting to kind of push away from that. Some of them, at least, some of my students did talk to me about, you know, they're starting to form their own religious opinions, but nobody really talked to me about even being Protestant. Yes. I did not see that. Um, that might be more in the country. I, I wouldn't doubt that, no. The end thing to look. It was very, very common for, my stu for the students to um, go home on the weekend. I mean, you know, when you're in the US and you're in college, you go home on the weekend, you go home every weekend. Oh my god, you know, you need to build yourself a life in this town. You need to make more friends. It's normal. That's what they do. That's why students get such cheap train fares is because they know they're going to go back and forth and back and forth. And um, I don't know about the house. I don't, well, I didn't talk to anybody that was building up a house like that, but it's very, very common for families of four or five to live in a one-bedroom apartment. Um, I have a, well, I'll pass this around now, actually. I have a PDF of a book. It's called Shortcuts to Poland. A friend of mine gave it to me. Um, he told me when he gave it to me, this explains two-thirds of your predecessor's behavior and one-third of yours. So this actually helped me quite a bit to analyze what's in Poland, but what you see in people's behavior in Poland. But one of the big questions in the quiz at the beginning is like, how Polish are you? And it's like six points if you sleep on a futon every night, two more points if you fold it up every day. And that's, if you have a small little apartment like that, you sleep on a futon. That's very, very normal. I stayed with a family in Bejeg. It was a new, newlywed couple. And they had a fairly nice apartment. I walked in the front door, and they had kind of a little mud room. And you walked in, there was a straight shot to the kitchen. There was the bathroom, and then there was the living room. And I almost asked, where do you sleep? And then I realized, you know, the couch is the futon. That's their bed. So if you would like me to send you a copy of that, please send, uh, write your email on here, and I'll get that out to you. Yes. You can find, there was an international church in Poznań. I never actually went. I kind of preferred to go sit through the mass in Polish. I couldn't really get a lot of it, but I just kind of, I don't know. I was used to it. That's what I knew, and I did that. There was a student's mass near where I live, so I went there all the time. They had a guitar playing nun. So. <laughs> okay. So, okay. Moving off of the last question we had about, I don't know how I got off on that tangent. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about a little bit was Corpus Christi. I got to know this family, like I said, that lived in Kielce. And they invited me and a few of the other Fulbrighters to come down and spend Corpus Christi with their family. And so that was quite the ordeal. They do a big mass in front of the church. And then they actually pull out a lot of the um, <clears throat> pictures and whatnot. And they parade them through the streets. It was about a three-hour ordeal. They had three other altars they stopped at, and then they brought it all back to the church. And so you saw a lot of little kids. They got out their first communion garb. They wear their first communion garb multiple times. I saw little kids everywhere all through May in their first communion outfits. And they get to help carry all of these things in the procession. And I actually equated it to um, May crowning that we have here, because they all had the little crowns on their head. And it just, it reminded me of that feeling as I remember doing that where you're, you know, you're so proud that you get to help. And so all these kids, they were kind of tied together with ribbon and there was usually a nun or someone kind of corralling them through the streets. And there were altar boys that actually had speakers on their backs. And that was their only job was to move these speakers throughout the procession. And so that you could hear whatever the priest was saying. And there was also a little old, um, I always refer to any older woman in Poland as a babcha. So there was a babcha, and she's, you know, carrying her picture on her back, and she's got her, I don't know what you want to call it, the carrier thing, and she reaches in her bag halfway through, pulls out a sandwich. She had her sandwich in the middle of the procession. She was enjoyable. But they have, um, and it's like a four, 
um, sticks or whatever you want to call it, and they use it to kind of shelter the Eucharist as they move it through the streets. So, and everybody in Kielce was there, everybody. And I got to talk to um, Vojimirsch, was the professor that took us. We called him the Vojinator, but he wasn't supposed to know that. <laughs> <laughs> I have many nicknames for Polish people. Um, but he took us, and his son was one of the altar servers. And I talked to him about it a little bit afterwards, and he was very, very proud that he was asked to be a part of this procession. So it was interesting just to see, he was about, what, 14, 15 years old. So it's still, it's very much a part of the community, very much a part of the culture. And I was talking with grandma about it. My grandmother's 80 years old, in her 80s. And she was telling me they did that when she was younger. She remembers moving around the four corners of the churches, and Jeanette is nodding. So Jeanette knows too. <laughs> We should do Corpus Christi. We should have a Corpus Christi celebration. Yeah. yeah. So the Polish Catholic Church, I've always, it's very old school. It's very traditional. And the other thing that I, it took me a while to get used to. You see, especially in, I lived in a bigger city where there was a seminary. So you saw nuns and priests everywhere. Um, you would see them on the trains, um, the priests in their long garb that went down to their ankles. You'd see a lot of young guys that had just entered the priesthood. Um, my friend and I had a joke, actually, that, you know, in the U.S., all the good guys are either married or gay. In Poland, they're either married or priests. <laughs> there are some good-looking priests. I kid. And then you would see nuns everywhere as well. I would see nuns on their bicycles with their backpacks. Um, my friend that actually gave me shortcuts to Poland and, well, this is in Shortcuts to Poland, actually. It's bad luck if you see one nun. And he was telling me about this. So for the rest of the time I was in Poland, I swear, everywhere I went, one nun, one nun, one nun. <laughs> Get on the train, sit down, here comes one nun. So, yes. yes? Sorry? I know, but they don't. <laughs> At least not when I'm around. <laughs> now, now, how do they dress? Do they dress with the... The, ha the habit, the whole works. You see all sorts of different, um, I don't know if they're different devotions, but I would see ones in blue, ones in black, ones in kind of brown or gray. Lots of, a lot of young women, a lot of young priests as well, which was different than what I'm used to seeing here. No. Is there one in German? I don't know. I have no, no, I have, well, you see them a lot. I have a picture of a bunch of them walking along the um, riverfront in Wrocław, and they all have their hands behind their backs. I always like that. So. No, I never did make it to Czestochowa. It's the big monasteries in Czestochowa. I never made it there. Oops, sorry. Oh, you're fine. Okay. So, anything else? Other questions, comments? Are you planning on going back soon? Not in the near future. I'd like to go back one day. It'd be, yeah, it'd be nice to, I still keep in touch with quite a few of my students. I have a couple friends there. Yeah. Yes? We were in Warsaw about eight years ago over Easter weekend, and it was so wonderful. Is it anything, do they still celebrate the same? Children were carrying the food to be blessed to the in the baskets, yeah. And the flowers and the, and um, the I don't know. Living uh, uh, the way of the cross and, uh, in the square. Uh, we were in uh, Krakow, wasn't it? Krakow. She came mm. from Krakow. I think it was in Warsaw. Warsaw. The, uh, the square. We went for dinner uh, on Good Friday, and mm. they had the Living Way of the Cross. Everything was quiet, and then all of us we heard all of this noise outside. I would and thousands black of people and the candle light. It was. Unreal. I would think they still do it. Honestly, I have I've been to Poland twice, and I've never been there for Easter. I've always ended up somewhere else. But I'm assuming they still do. Um, I talked to people that went to um, Easter Vigil, and they said it was a very, very, very long mass. Anything? Anything else? Yes. Okay. A um, couple other things I wanted to touch upon. Uh, just kind of random things that I picked up. Um, okay, so you and I have just met on the street. I say to you, how are you? 
What do you say? Fine, how are you? Well, I'm good. So do I really want to know how you are? See, exactly. <laughs> This is another place where shortcuts to pull in kind of helped me explain what was going on around me. Um, I shared my office with, there were six of us in there. It was me, another woman, and then four other professors that came randomly. And one of the professors, he thought I was happy all the time. He told me this too. And I finally realized after I was reading this book that every time he asked me, how are you? I would say, I'm good, I'm great, today's good. And when, when you ask a Polish individual, how are you? They're going to tell you. <laughs> and they expected me to tell them. So when I said I'm good, they assumed I was good. So I would go into my office and I'd say, Marcin, how are you? Oh, I went to Bidgosh this weekend and I saw my in-laws. I don't like my in-laws. <laughs> and I don't like that drive. <laughs> and my daughter is sick. And it's just, they're going to tell you straight out. The other thing that I picked up after a while of going to a lot of coffee, is you talk to people, you say, oh, you know, I have to go, but we should have coffee sometime. We should have lunch. They take those invitations very, very seriously. <laughs> they will call you. We were talking about this earlier. They do the same thing in Germany. Yeah. They will call you. They will find you. They expect to have that lunch. <laughs> the other thing, when they invite you to come over, it's serious. Um, my friend who spent a lot of time around a lot of Americans, he said something to me once that, Americans, they offer you things when you come over, and if you say no, that's the end. Polish people, they will offer and offer and offer and offer. Do you want something to drink? Do you want something to drink? Do you want something to drink now? You should have something to drink. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they are. No, I'm serious. The friend I had was from Romania, but maybe. I could see that. May, that might be. She offered it three times. Yeah, they were relentless. The other thing was, if you went over to someone's house for a holiday, they were going to feed you and feed you and feed you. I got the opportunity to go to an Oshimnashka, an 18th birthday party. It's kind of their equivalent of the Sweet 16. Um, when I was a student, my roommate invited me. It was her sister. And so they fed us. I mean, they brought out dinner, and then they brought out another dinner, and then there was soup, and then there was cake, and oh, we should have pizza. <laughs> and just, like, friends of mine went to... Um, I think it was an Easter Monday, and she said they ate till they were uncomfortable, and then they wanted them to eat more, and then they sent leftovers with them. So there's a lot of food involved. Um, but they're not overweight. No, it's very, very, well, they do that sporadically. That was, well, one of the things, we were coming back from Christmas, and all of the girls told me in my class, I gained weight, I gained weight, but they're very much a walking culture. You walk everywhere. I mean, bicycles, sometimes there's better places to bicycle than Pose 9, in my opinion. You get hit by cars. But yes, you walk everywhere. Um, it's just, that's their means of getting around. It was very, very rare for me to find a student that had a car. The other thing is the way they eat their meals. I mean, you eat kind of your breakfast in the morning, and then you might have a little snack before noon, but your real lunch doesn't happen till like 2.30, 3 o'clock, maybe even later than that. And then, you know, your dinner or whatever we would call it, that might be a sandwich. I mean, I tried to stick to my American way of eating for a while, and I would bring, like, I'd have a sandwich and an apple, and I'd bring it into, an, into the office. And my supervisor would always tell me, he's like, that's not proper food. Not proper food. You need potatoes. You need this. <laughs> and that's, I call them communist leftovers. I'm sure that's another one of them. Everybody worked till the same time. You got off at 3, 30, 4 o'clock. That's when Bobcha had dinner ready, so that's when you ate. And so they still stick to that. There were no heavy chili. No. It's, that's one of the things that I noticed, really, when I first came home, was just the, how much smaller people are there. All of Europe is like that, I think. Yeah. Polish, if you go to Poland, though, they're, they're just built differently than we are. They're very, very skinny. The men are very skinny. The girls are tiny little people. Like some of my students, I seriously wanted to feed them a sandwich. So, yeah, I yeah. Tell you, my daughter was an exchange student in France for a year, mm -hmm. and that is one of the things they do in France is um, seven course meal, especially supper time or their dinner, whatever it would be called there. And anyway, it just lasted forever, it seemed, <laughs> and always wine with their meal. Yeah. And uh, one of the things that she noticed is that they didn't bathe very 
often mm -hmm. because water is very precious in France. Yeah. And uh, what was another thing you said? Um, oh, I can't think of it now. But yeah, the, the meals. They they just and if you didn't eat what they served, they it was an insult. Yes. You know, like she called me and she said, "Mom, you won't believe what they fed me and what they <laughs> served me." It moved on the plate. <laughs> 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 That's the showering thing is Americans shower a lot, probably more than any other people in the world. Yeah, we shower way too much. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about was the whole Polish people, they are polite. You do the whole, you know, please, thank you, da da da, prosha, whatever. But when you're walking down the street, they're very, you're just slumber. And I know I was doing it when I came home, I probably looked mean. But. When you're walking down the street in the U.S., say Roman and I are walking, da da da, on the sidewalk, and we get to each other, and oh ha ha, you know, we go around each other, hello, good morning. Even if I didn't know you, we'd do that. I got shouldered so many times in that country. Your personal space bubble just shrinks, just boom, and people keep going. That's the way it works. It's not an insult. They're just walking. They don't know you. Um, yes, yeah, space bubble on the trams. I mean, you're crammed in. Riding on a train car, if you turn this pew around, probably from this pew to that pew, there would be eight people in there. You would ride the whole way on the train, your knees touching, you didn't have to say anything to anybody. I mean, a lot of the times if you wanted to, you sat in silence. And then you say your gin dobre when you come in, sit there, you say your dovezenia as you leave, and that's that. Although I did really, I did a lot of trying to talk to older, especially old women on trains just because they would tolerate my broken Polish, they would try and help me, and then, you know, if I messed up, I never had to see them again. So, yes. um, also, oh, old, this I also found interesting. Uh, there was a Fulbrighter in Kielce that I also spent time with. He had two small children. One was two, one was five. And the old women in Poland, they felt that they had the right to tell his wife exactly how she should dress those children. Oh, you have to have a hat. And if there's not a hat on that kid's head, you're not a good mother and something's wrong. Oh, and then also my friend from California that was in Kielce, old, the older ladies, they were constantly telling her that she needed to put on more clothes. You need to put on some shoes. You need to take off your flip-flops. You should be wearing a scarf. You should be wearing a hat. Granted, she... Well, and this is my favorite story to describe her. She called me in January one day, and she said, I've had this great epiphany. I finally realized, Leanne, you can't just look outside, say it's sunny. Yay, it's warm. I can go. This was in the middle of January, so. All right. Do we have any other questions, comments, random things? The first thing, yes. The other thing was walking in France. Everybody there, walks. Like, Walk. My daughter had to walk three or four miles every day to school, and then if she had a three-hour break, because sometimes she had evening classes, because mm -hmm. their classes went for a long time. Yeah. And she'd walk back to her host family, and then walk back. So she just walked and walked. She lost a lot of weight. Yeah. She was there. <laughs> Honestly, I didn't realize how much I was walking over there until a friend of mine from the U.S. came to visit me. And I was just kind of, you know, taking her around, showing her what I do every day. And she was just like, you do this every day. I was like, yeah, here we go. Come on. <laughs> Yeah. Now, uh, in France, they can't drive until they're 19. Oh, yeah. Um, I want to say it's 18. But to get a Polish driver's license, is it sounds like a hellish ordeal. Um, you see these cars driving around, and they have an L on the top. Blue sign, white L. And it means lector, like lesson, I'm learning. Oh. And you can only practice driving with one of these licensed lectors. Exactly. <laughs> Loser. <laughs> But students, I think they have to get about 60 hours of driving time, and then they can take their exam. And if you don't pass it, you start it all over again. Yeah, it's not cheap to get these licensed people to drive with you. And I would, yeah. Yeah, there's a zero tolerance. You also, there's zero tolerance for talking on your cell phone and driving at the same time. But despite that, Poland is one of the most notorious countries for bad drivers. The last, I think, three or four days I was with the other Fulbrighters, we rented a car and went up to, um, we were in Olszyn up, up here. And we were driving around the lakes. And I swear to you, it's like Mario cars. When um, 
Uh, in the US, when you pass people, it's kind of a sign of aggression. People don't really like it. There, you're expected to just kind of get off onto the shoulder and let them around you. There was a lot of cars coming head on at one another. You go around curves, and you would see signs for how many people had been injured on that curve, how many people had been killed. And that was kind of their way of trying to get you to slow down. I would say less than one. Yeah. I mean, public transportation is ridiculously cheap. I mean, I would go, when I went to Warsaw, that was 40 zwati, so less than, between 12 and $15, depending on the exchange rate. Um, to go to Kielce was around 60, so about $20. And that was about, a, usually between a seven and an eight hour ride. Train ride. Train ride, yes. When my parents came over in, what was that, the beginning of July, 